Hello, listener. You are on a bonus overdose of the Plastic Pills podcast, where we are back today on Deleuze. And today's a treat because I have with me an OG Deleuze scholar and translator in Charles Stavall. Uh, most of the people on this, or most of my listeners and viewers, happen to be younger than me, and I'm not even very old. That's why we're joined by Charles today, who is, with all due respect, old. And has been reading and writing and translating Deleuze since before most of us were born. So if you've read a lot of Deleuze, you may already know, unbeknownst or announced to you, Charles' books, Gilles Deleuze ABCs and Gilles Deleuze uh, Key Concepts. He also works with Daniel W. Smith, who is one of, if not the top, Anglophone Deleuze scholars and commentators in the world. Um, and Charles, I didn't know this until I just checked, but you also translated the new edition of Deleuze's Logic of Sense. Yes, indeed. That was a, that's a new, actually, that's an updated translation from the 1990 translation. Most people don't know that. It just sort of slipped out there onto the market, but we did a complete review. Uh, Const Constantine Bundes and I did a complete review of the original translation. So um, we made sure that we got our crossed all our T's and dotted our I's for a change because the first one had some mistakes. Well, that's disheartening because I only have the first one. I didn't know that the second one existed until they're not they're not huge. Don't worry, you won't you won't go go wrong, but it's just it's nice to get things translated, right? All right. So you're hearing the voice, of course, of Charles Stival, um, until recently professor of French studies at Wayne State. Is that right? Correct. Uh-huh. Um, and all this to say, if you're here, you're riding the Deleuze hype train and there's a treat for you. So, uh, Charles, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you. Um, first questions first, being the OG Deleuze scholar in the room, can you take us back to the beginning? Maybe give us a picture of the academic climate when you were a, a grad student and after, and perhaps why Deleuze studies became a research project that you wanted to spend now so much time on. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I started reading Deleuze back in the mid seventies uh, when I was in graduate school at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And um, at that time, uh, the US was in a weird uh, position because uh, uh, whereas structuralism in France for all practical purposes was done with by around the late 60s, early 70s, um, and they had moved on to what we've come to know as, as post-structuralism. Um, in the U.S., there was a you know translation gap. Uh, most of the people who were been reading structuralism were in French departments, reading it in French. But to make to make the breakout, of course, these isms have to get into translation. And so the structuralist stuff, and particularly a lot of Roland Barthes stuff at the time, really rolled out into translation into in the in the 70s. But was odd about it was that also at the same time that was rolling out into translation were works by the, the major works of Foucault and Derrida. And and the crazy thing about that was that you had this sort of layering of people sort of trying to absorb structuralism and not being in many cases, not being fully aware of the differences between, say, what Bach might have been saying in the early 60s and what Foucault was saying in the early 70s or Derrida was saying in the early 70s. And so that's kind of, I mean, that was my problem, was trying to sort all this stuff out. Because when I came into graduate school, uh, particularly at Champaign-Urbana in the mid-70s, there was all this stuff out there just, you know, floating about this thing we came to call just generally theory. And uh, so it was it was sort of picking through all that um, that I came upon. I was working on I was actually more into Lacan than I was into Deleuze initially. And I was reading a lot of Lacan and um, and I met a group of guys at Champaign-Urbana, um, including Larry Grossberg, and who you know went on to become a, a rather well-known scholar in cultural studies. And Larry was uh, trying to put together a working group, and we started off talking about Lacan and trying to get, you know, come to terms with some of Lacan's essays. And then the next semester, we had the new translation of Anti-Oedipus, 
on hand. And so we worked through that for a semester. And then we moved on to working on different essays by Foucault. And um, so it was with that seminar, with that project, that I started really trying to come to terms with Deleuze and um, not letting go of it. Like, you know, just not, okay, the semester's over, now I can move to Foucault. I mean, I, I really stuck with the um, anti-Oedipus text, trying to figure out why it was so uh, perplexing, annoying, fascinating. Hmm. And um, and I just uh, gradually, you know, like Kudzu, started looking at Deleuze's other texts and and I'd also encountered um, logic of sense um, on, a, on a completely different track in French studies um, somebody I know had done an essay on um, using logic of sense um, pretty much uh, in terms of literary studies which you know struck me as really odd the problem with logic of sense was at that point it was on, it was only available in French and um, uh, I, I really had a hard time making heads or tails of um, how this guy was moving back and forth between Lewis Carroll and, um, you know, logic and sense. And, and and I really, it took me quite a few years to to make sense of that. But the same was true of Anti-Oedipus. So that's pretty much how I got involved. And then I just started, you know, an academic career and, you know, I hate to put it this way, but when you you're in, particularly in those days, we had to you, you kind of had to lay your cards down and hope for the best in terms of who you, where you put your professional commitments. And uh, um, there were a lot of different options in terms of being in French studies, um, and I was pretty much involved with reading narratology and reading Gerard Genet and a number of other uh, French writers and more oriented towards literature. But I stuck with Deleuze and I just kept reading Deleuze and, and began to write little bits and pieces about him. And, and uh, um, so, you know, it just became an important part of, uh, of uh, what I was doing and thinking. So. so this sounds like the time that academics my age dream back to as the good old days. All the French thinkers are coming into English, Foucault, Derrida, Lacan and Deleuze. And so... I mean, you can confirm to me whether or not that rosy nostalgia is true or not, but did you focus on Deleuze out of all the stuff that you were reading because there was a lack of uh, academic resources available or because that was your, your favorite an encounter? It, it was a combination of the first couple aspects of the first. Um, favorite would have been strong, um, but uh, it, it was the fact that in a lot of ways, I, I was the, in some cases I was the only guy in the room who could read French, oh. and uh, so I'd end up, particularly in that seminar that I was mentioning with Larry Grossberg. This is in Illinois, right? Yeah, in Illinois, and uh, but also subsequently I'd go to you know uh, when I go to few when I weren't, wasn't going to French conferences, I was going to different other conferences. Um, you know, there would be a lot of commentary about these writers, but had been read only in English. So I, you know, I was sort of uh, a lot of ways uh, an annoying presence because uh, of having actually read the things in French and, <laughs> and and not trying to lord that over anybody, but it just sometimes it, it sometimes it can make a difference. And um, particularly when you're trying to work through an English translation, a thorny passage, and, you know, if you can have access, access to the, um, French text and see uh, where the what the original is trying to say, if that's clarifying. Sometimes it's tough in either language. And you studied in France for a while, too. I think I also read today. Did, I did um, a, a, an undergraduate year there, and I, uh, stood, I did my master's at the uh, Sorbonne. And then um, and I, I worked over there uh, running junior year programs completely, you know, uh, a part of my academic career was, you know, um, just getting these. Uh, in, in the late 70s, I, it was hard to get a job. And so I ran some junior year programs uh, sort of to tide me over for a year. So I just lived in France. And, you know, that's an enriching experience all in itself, you know, just being around and soaking up the culture. Yeah, this sounds like uh, the the rosy vision that every academic wishes they had a chance. <laughs> yeah. well, um, you, until you had to see what your paycheck was. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's established. I want I want to give you a quick question that no doubt has a long answer, but 
I get this question everywhere I post, no matter what I post. So if we could just get it out of the way to start, I'd like to ask you this. Um, where do I start with Deleuze? And there's clearly a difference between his monographic texts and then his work with Qatari and now the lectures that you're going to discuss today. So where would you start if you think you're interested in Deleuze, but you're not sure yet? Well, um, my the shorter shortest answer I can give you is um, I like the book that Deleuze came out with. Um, it was published, I believe, in um, 19 in the original French was published in 1991. Uh, uh, 1990, and then it was translated just a few years later. Negotiations is the um, translated title. Pour parler is the French title. Um, was this, did he oversee its publication? Because you're saying it's kind of collecting a whole bunch of his different works? Well, it was published by his his editor, okay. Minui. And um, so it came out in 1990. So basically what... Uh, they did was to put together um, some, as he, I'm looking at his introductory paragraph here, putting together some texts of uh, discussions um, that took place over a 20 year period. And um, so it's basically a, a way of getting uh, a, a lot of random things that were just floating around out there uh, uh, into print while he was still alive. And um, the thing, the reason I like this text um, is that it's a whole bunch of uh, Deleuze's shorter texts, but it's chopped up into five sections. Um, the first one is on, the first section's on Anti-Oedipus, uh, as well as A Thousand Plateaus. Um, the second one is about, second section's about cinema, different aspects of, on the cinema project. Third is on Foucault, and those essays are, those are interviews that Deleuze gave, and extremely important um, to, as sort of eventually the person then goes to read the book that Deleuze wrote on Foucault, um, you know, they really, they really mesh with each other. They, the, the interviews uh, enliven in, in a lot of the texts that Deleuze wrote. He has a section number four is on, it's called philosophy. And it's a number of just general different takes that he has on different aspects of his philosophical undertaking. And one of the important essays in there is called Mediators, which is his idea of antecessor, or people who intercede within projects to help people along or help something along. And that's the idea of mediating between one thing and another. And that's a really cool idea that he comes up with. But he, he throws off all kinds of other interesting ideas, getting getting to his point in those. And then the final one is politics. It's only got two essays. And one of those is the postscript on control societies, which has its own status. on. You can find that probably anywhere on the Internet. Um, and, you know, it, it it's, it's sort of the late Deleuze. Uh, where many people would have liked Deleuze to go if his health was better, if he'd been, you know, been more active somehow um, following his teaching career. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's pretty revealing, and and it's you know, I think every everybody knows that one who's reading Deleuze. But in any case, somebody who wanted to start, that's a sample. Of course, what that omits is that since it starts with. Uh, a thousand plateaus and 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 uh, um, excuse me with anti Oedipus and a thousand plateaus, that sort of cuts out all of Deleuze's philosophy prior to um, 1970, and uh, that's of course the bulk of uh, a lot of his interesting early stuff. And uh, so it's not that you don't glean and glean aspects of that in negotiations. It's just that from there, for for those. Uh, I, I think I'd suggest possibly uh, looking at his book, a short, short uh, interview book that he did um, with Claire Parnay, Dialogues, although that, that tends to be more situated within the 70s as well. Or uh, give myself a plug uh, for the Deleuze's ABCs. Um, the ABC d'Air de Gilles Deleuze was an eight-hour interview that he did with Claire Parnay. He did this uh, about a year after he retired from teaching. So this would be situated <clears throat> in 88 and 89. And um, 
it's structured as uh, an A through Z type of topic um, uh, uh, discussion. So A is animal, B is drinking, which is boire, and on and on, C is in culture. And as he gets warmed up uh, in the discussion with Parnay, he covers a lot of ground and brings up on many other many of his topics that uh, that show up in the earlier works. And um, though you don't take any deep dives, for example, you don't take any deep dives into logic of sense information or difference in repetition. Nonetheless, you know, aspects of Kant, K is in Kant is one of the uh, letters, and Nietzsche pops up uh, all the time uh, in, in his discussion. Um, so that's another accessible uh, text, uh, not a text so much as a, it's a uh, DVD that you can just purchase online um, through anywhere. You know, you can just uh, um, Google it. Gilles, Gilles Deleuze from A to Z is the uh, actual title. And uh, that, those are those are you know a couple different directions. My friend Dan Smith, uh, I asked him you know what he thought of this question, and you know he said, well, to, if you're interested in Nietzsche, then read the Nietzsche book. I mean, it's as simple as that. And uh, if you're interested in Spinoza, there are several different Spinoza books. There's a long Spinoza book and a short Spinoza book. I'd say the short Spinoza book is is a, is a great place to start. Um, but, uh, you know, it just there's that's the, sort of the deep end of the pool approach too. you know, if you want to read a text, we'll just go ahead and read it. And if you can't make any sense of it, well, there's lots of commentary out there to to, to give you some direction. You know, subsequently, there have been a couple there's about three different volumes that have come out of all of his random stuff, um, the, the material that was not published in um uh, actually, some of the material that was published in Negotiations is in those three volumes there. Um, uh, Desert Islands is one of them. Desert Islands, I, Desert Islands, right. Uh, two Regimes of Madness. And yeah. then the most recent one is Letters and Other Texts. And, uh, you know, that has a lot of interesting, there's a lot of interesting tidbits in there. To, and reading Deleuze's correspondence, he was an extraordinarily generous guy. When it came to correspondence, I, I just I have about four or five letters from him that he wrote to me while I was a young professor, you know, in the 1980s. And, you know, the guy's generosity of just taking time out of his day to, to actually, you know, acknowledge and give you some information. And we tried to we set we were corresponding back and forth for several years trying to set up a meeting, which eventually took place. But it took a, he was, you know. It, my schedule, his schedule, at some couple of years, it didn't work out. So too bad you didn't have Zoom, eh? Yeah, well, uh, you know, you got to be able to plug in, and download the app. Yeah. <laughs> um. So a lot of answers to where do I start might be the ABCs, might be La Besidere. If you can, I haven't, I haven't seen that online yet. So maybe I'll, I'll look before I put this up and see if I can find a link to it. That's the other thing that we were discussing earlier. Uh, if you go to YouTube um, and you know look look for Deleuze ABC, you might be able to find um, all twenty six uh, uh, or maybe twenty four uh, sections of it uh, audio uh, the audio visual right there on YouTube. It just depends on right. who's who's blocked it or not. You know, right. for copyright um, purposes. Yeah, this was aired on French television. Um, in case it's actually not French, it was a European network, Arte. Okay. So it was published. It was you know broadcast across Europe um, with subtitles, uh, I guess, managed by each of the national uh, um, you know national broadcasting companies. So if you saw it in Germany, you'd see it with the German subtitles, and that's, you know Italy, Spain, you know, so France no subtitles, and uh, so yeah, that's better to be in a country with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's public funded broadcasting. I don't see a Deleuze Netflix special coming out anytime soon. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> All right, so let's move into the actual meat of this interview, which is your, it sounds like an extended uh, giant swath of not a single project, but several projects called the Deleuze Seminars. So I'm not a Deleuze scholar, though I have read the books. Most, most of them, not all. Um, I like them, but often I, as a reader, don't really feel a compulsion to go beyond an author's work into the extra literary material. 
Um, and this might sound like a mistake from what we've talked about already. Uh, this might sound like a mistake for me in this case. So what's unknown to many readers, including myself, is that the books, many of Deleuze's books, are actually the outputs or products of lectures and seminars that include uh, you know, other people, discussions. Um, and you can see this most tellingly in A Thousand Plateaus, um, where you, if you know, the sources come from all over the place. They're from different academic departments, different disciplines. They're bouncing everywhere. And he didn't do all this work himself with just guitar. It was a collaborative seminar environment. So, um, and this is a case with the other books too, which I didn't even know until I checked out Charles's work. So Charles, can you tell us a little bit about how these processes went in your understanding and why just reading the books alone might leave some gaps in your knowledge about the, uh, the act in thought that's being performed there. Okay, well, the, 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 the way this got started was again through a gap. Um, Dan Smith wanted to teach a seminar on Foucault and he noticed that the, um, uh, the he wanted to really get into the uh, into Foucault and Deleuze on Foucault. And he noticed that there are, there are 26 lectures uh, that Deleuze did on Foucault in 1985-86, but he noticed that some of the transcriptions hadn't even been done. And uh, maybe I should back up and mention that uh, um, from 1979 to the end of Deleuze's teaching in 1987, when he retired, there was a young man named Hidenobu Suzuki um, who came to uh, France in 1979 to um, study literature and somehow he got he heard about this guy out in uh, the east of Paris at the Vincennes campus that was talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. And it turns out that since this guy liked Kafka, um, he uh, wanted to learn about Kafka. He learned heard that this Deleuze guy had written a book on Kafka with some other crazy guy named Guattari. And um, so he went out to the lecture and he quickly noticed that this room was packed. But he decided that this was kind of going beyond his sprint skills, so he took his tape recorder. And, um, well, and the rest is history. Hidenobu Suzuki turned out to be this absolutely strong-willed, disciplined young man, tech-oriented, great, great uh, recording machine, apparently. And um, he would get there early enough so he could sit next to Deleuze year in, year out recording every one of his lectures and um despite certain gaps which you're you know you can imagine this is people are only human nonetheless uh and this was old technology by the way so this was cassette recording there are always little gaps at about minute 46 um at the end of a cassette when the cassette has to right. change right. but uh by the way a lot of people who are listening to this might not even have ever held a cassette in their hands so <laughs> so yeah so when i'm listening and, and transcribing i'm always waiting for minute 46 um so the uh and you say why 46 minutes because there are 45 minute cassettes that also had a little bit longer on the cassette that would go to about 46 and a half. So uh, uh, subsequently, the Bibliothèque Nationale found this uh, 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 um, uh, project uh, to have been in a part of what they call the patrimony of France. And so they, uh, they acquired it from the young man and they digitized it. And now it's available through the Bibliothèque Nationale and the, the French recordings you can listen to have been French directly from the Bibliothèque Nationale and their Gallica software. So um, anyhow, jumping ahead, Dan uh, found that there was gaps and he wanted to try to fill in some of those gaps. So he got funding through his university, Purdue University, to, be, to fund the transcriptions. And, um, and this was the beginning of his project, got several different grants and then um, gradually came through the NEH, the International Endowment for the Humanities, got a large grant from them. And so the project is to try to make sure we have the transcriptions that are accurate and translations that are faithful to those transcriptions and making them available publicly through Purdue's uh, site, the, the, the Deleuze Seminar site. Now, why listen to these at all? Um, okay, it, it, going back to our earlier question, where do you start with Deleuze? If you're starting with Deleuze, then these things are probably this 
site is probably not of that great interest. Um, but one of the, and if you don't speak French, if you can't hear the audio and hear the interactions, that also, there's a certain aspect that Roland Buck called the grain of the voice. You know, the grain of the voice really has a lot uh, to do with it. But if you're just hearing some guy speaking French and it's not making any sense, that can be charming for about 10 seconds. And then, you know, you want to go on and do something else. But the translations, if you don't speak French, uh, read French, the translations show as much as we were able to do in print the kind of atmosphere that reigned in, in his classrooms. And um, and that's one of the amazing things about all this is that um, the classrooms were predominantly Deleuze. Let's be frank. This is a professor who commanded a lot of respect, and he did a lot of work to prepare for each of his seminars. Um, but these were in uh, a, a public French university classrooms, the seminars, and through through many political uh, upheavals uh, on the university campuses as well as in France more more generally. So uh, a lot of the seminars have people making uh, wild uh, interventions and um, watching how Deleuze handles these things is just uh, a- astonishing because he is a, uh, a master of diplomacy. Uh, so there, there are hecklers in French higher education lectures. Oh my God. <laughs> and there, there are all kinds of, there are all kinds of hecklers. I mean, they're come, there are hecklers who come and just, you know, are there to be disruptive. Uh, but there are also the hecklers who think they know stuff. And um, there's this one guy throughout year after year of reading these, um, uh, listening to these tapes and, and reading this one guy named, his name is Georges Comtesse. And this guy is very, very knowledgeable man. Um, but he was basically Deleuze's um, nemesis, as it were. Um, at some point during the course of any seminar, you could expect a, a Comtesse to sort of raise his hand and you'd hear this soft voice gradually begin to build. And then he would just hold forth 15, 20 minutes uh, just giving these mini lectures, and Deleuze just Deleuze just came to accept that. In fact, Deleuze, being smart, uh, he invited the guy on certain for the Foucault seminar. I mean, this guy knew a lot about Foucault, had a different take on Foucault than Deleuze. So Deleuze just let him at different points during the seminar um, hold forth. I mean, he'd invite him to he'd, he'd structure it in to the seminar, and um, you know, the guy was listening to him he was so taken with his he was so taken with every syllable that he said you could tell he was so invested that no pearl that came out of his mouth was uh to be wasted and um but Deleuze you know got past that personal aspect and really was able to focus uh in a way that I've never experienced able to focus on what the content was to deal just with the substance and, and be able to respond to that. And uh, an amazing thing. So uh, I'm not really, I think I've sort of gotten sidetracked on the, the initial question of why read this stuff. Um, it's to enrich one's understanding. There's a whole personal side to it. Um, let's take, I mean, the one that I uh, um, can speak to, um, you know, I did the all 20 of the uh, lectures on the fold. Deleuze's um, final, I don't want to say this wasn't his final book, but it was the final book on a specific philosopher, uh, Leibniz. And um, the, the title of the fold is, it's actually The Fold, Leibniz, and the Baroque. And um, he did two seminars on Leibniz. So this makes this makes Leibniz kind of special in, in Deleuze land. The uh, first were five lectures that he did in 1980, in the spring of 1980. And it's sort of, and I, wanna, I don't want to say it's Leibniz, Leibniz light, but it was Deleuze trying to come to terms with Leibniz um, quickly, efficiently, but thoroughly uh, in a five-week uh, a group of uh, lectures. But then he came back to Leibniz in, in 1986 and 87. And the reason was, there's there's several reasons why. Um, one, he, w- he had already spent a year 
working on Foucault, uh, 85, 86, and the book on Foucault came out. But prior to that, he had spent four full years working on cinema and philosophy. And those lectures uh, informed the two books that he, he brought out, um, the, the, the Movement Image and the Time Image, two separate books. And um, the four years were this is attempt to try to actually come to terms with how cinema intersects with philosophy in ways that he felt were satisfying. And frankly, the craziest thing about these was that it, when you get to the end of year one, Deleuze basically says, hey, you know what, I kind of screwed up here. And so we're going to just do a do-over in year two. And so sure enough, you come into the fall and he goes back over everything he had done in year <laughs> one, but sort of twisted in a different direction. So you're working the same material, but like from a different angle. And so it's, it's, it's new. And then three and years, three and four, we're developing uh, the time image more and just extending. But the purpose of him to going through all this was coming through a huge project that was in the back of his mind for well over a decade. And that was his idea of doing a book on what is philosophy. And um, every one of these seminars, the, the uh, Leibniz one in, in 1980, the Spinoza one that came in 1981, four years of cinema, in um, 1982 to 1985, Foucault 1986, and the Leibniz in 1987, 86-87 were all part of his much larger um, project of what is philosophy. And in fact, he says at the beginning of the 1986 seminar on Leibniz, he says, I really wanted to do a seminar on what is philosophy, but I just didn't have the courage to, to face this yet. And so for him, this was a massive idea, massive project. But one of the things you discover in listening to or reading through the Leibniz lectures, if you looked at the fold, if you've had the chance to try to work through the book, it is one of the, uh, it was one of the, one of the tightest, most compressed um, it's freeze. I call it freeze dried Deleuze. I mean, every sentence is is a morsel that if you were able to pour a little water onto it, it would expand out into all kinds of other stuff that you could say. And that's the amazing thing about following through the 20 lectures of the Leibniz seminars is it takes the material that you find in um, the fold chap chapter by chapter and just blows it up, blow not only blow it up and exploding it, but expanding it in ways that really bring in, you might have a reference here, a tiny footnote in, in the fold, which is 10 minutes of, of the particular lecture. And uh, the other aspect is somewhere in the springtime, I couldn't, couldn't, I have to look it up, but one of the one of the lectures in the spring is dedicated to the topic of what is philosophy. And basically he lays out kind of the groundwork for what will become most of the opening chapter of uh, of what is philosophy, the the the, the large structure that he, he'll be developing, and he hasn't quite worked it all out yet. That takes a few more years and consulting with Guattari, but still, he's he's got in mind what he wants to do. So, the, the in this case, for example, the fold that really gives you. I mean, I I was in a group seminar. Um, on the fold with some, some friends uh, uh, about 15 years ago, and it never even occurred to me. It was, I, it was right there at my fingertips, um, and it didn't even occur to me to look at the seminars and and uh, just to see, well, maybe they might offer us a little bit a, a different perspective. Yeah, they offer us a, a whole perspective. You want to know about the whole topic of point of view? He's got a whole two and a half hour lecture on point of view. Um, you want to learn about singularities? He looks at singularities from every angle, including the mathematical uh, angle, and he brings in a mathematician from the department uh, at Saint-Denis to discuss uh, singularities from the mathematical perspective. And that's one of the most interesting lectures. I think it's on January 20th uh, of uh, 1987. So just an amazing lecture from somebody who, who came to the seminar and said, hey, you want to talk about this? And, well, okay, why don't you do that? Isabel Stengers comes uh, to talk about um, Whitehead 
And there's a whole section in the 19 uh, uh, in the 1987 spring winter spring part of the seminar where he talks about Leibniz and Whitehead in great detail, expanding that out. Whitehead makes a sort of a guest appearance in the fold the book, but you know it's it's a quick on and a quick off, whereas Whitehead gets you know a, a lot of development. So uh, it's it, it's a pretty interesting uh, project, and year after year. You see how student input, um, Deleuze calling on the resources of the people he's come to know in the seminars uh, over the years. And of course, these aren't just students. They're people who just come, take time out of their lives to um, uh, be there on Tuesday, late Tuesday morning and into Tuesday afternoon to go to Deleuze's seminars. And they might be, uh, you know, plumbers, they might be um, uh, the widows who have, this is something what they do on Tuesday morning and they sit in the front row. And that, that sounds more like Lacan than Deleuze. But uh, nonetheless, you know, you have all manner of people. And that was one of the things that Deleuze really loved about his audience was that there's this whole diversity there uh, that he could draw upon um, as part as a resource for his work. So he's a little bit of a celebrity. Um, I just want to rephrase what you said, what you were saying. Uh, what we're talking about is the book on Leibniz, The Fold. Um, and this book, I don't understand how anyone could read this without the internet because the references are so broad. Um, he's, he's talking about m music then mathematics, then Leibniz, then then some other philosopher, and I don't know how anyone like be, being alive now. I think makes this possible, but I couldn't. I had to read this book in front of the computer and basically Google every reference that he's bringing up because it's constant and it's not organized. But you telling this story about okay, there's a a mathematics professor coming in, or there's an art person coming in, or a I don't know, a, a, music, a musicologist coming in. This kind of gives sense to why the book is written like that, because as a book, it's a nightmare. Um, but if you're seeing this as the tip of the iceberg of a whole bunch of work, a whole bunch of lectures, a whole bunch of uh, guests all coming in, then it kind of makes this book make a lot more sense. And you're saying that this isn't just the Leibniz book that does this, which is under 120 pages or so. Maybe it's about that. 130, yeah. Um, yeah. And then all of these books are like that is what you're saying. So this seems like a kind of a necessary resource, unless you have Google, maybe. I think of Leibniz as the extreme um, in that regard. Okay. Really, he was really, I'm going to make this as terse as I possibly can. And I don't know why. I don't think he really had a page length uh, uh, limitation in, in, in what he was writing. But um, the thing that's thing that, that, that your comment really makes me think of that if you look also another reason for looking at the if, if you're into, into this book, The Fold, and you think, oh, my God, what a hodgepodge, um, then you should look at the way he lays out his course, because his course is very, very, of course, follows the structure of the book. Right. Um, but the way he lays out the course it's very logical why you would have this particular unfolding, uh, so to speak, uh, in the way uh, that he does it. And, um, and he organizes the course in the course in um, two segments, one Leibniz and philosophy, which corresponds roughly to chapters one, two and three. And then he deals with what he calls Leibniz and freedom. And that pretty much deals with what would correspond to the rest of the book after chapter maybe three or four. Um, but there he's dealing with the concept of freedom in a broad sense within Leibniz. And, you know, that was something that struck me as very, very odd when I was starting, when I was working on the translations, because when I had already read the fold and I thought to myself, freedom, what does that have to do with anything? And I realized, oh, duh, you missed it. Uh, when you're reading through this the first two or three two or three times, it's such an important concept, but it's just sort of a stealth concept um, that's 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 working its way through uh, all these other myriad concepts and theoreticians, as you mentioned, uh, that are brought into 
sort of exemplify different aspects of uh, of the fold. I mean, the whole architectural aspect of the fold uh, early on is something that can be extraordinarily off-putting if you've never considered Baroque architecture or, uh, you know, Baroque sculpture or anything. And that itself, you know, in the book, it's really, really tight. He develops that in, in really interesting detail in the opening lectures of, of that seminar. Yeah, so, I mean, I thought he was being deliberately obscurantist. So it, it's really helpful that I have you to tell me that this is what was happening because it makes it seem like, okay, okay, it was a, a, very, a very tight condensation of a whole lot of work from a whole lot of people. And we could say that yeah. about Deleuze's general philosophical project as well. For sure. If the books are highly abridged versions of the lectures, um, I'll ask for I'll ask for some links. But um, what are you doing with your with the project with Dan Smith putting this all um, online? Is it going to be like open access? Is it going to be a book eventually or a series of books? What do you what do you have planned for that? No, no, no books. It won't be any books. Um, that's a that's sort of a stipulation by the Deleuze family. Um, they won't, uh, they don't want any, he didn't want any of this stuff in print, but the opposite side of the coin is it's complete open access free to anybody who can link on to it. So, um, and, and a lot of it's already available. Um, you know, it's, uh, at the, the website is for those of you who have a pencil ready. Um, I'll put it in the link so they can click okay. on it. Okay. So it's, uh, Deleuze.cla.com purdue.edu and um and that takes you to the the front page and then you just work your way from there um but one of the the biggest discovery for me uh in this project i I got involved with this actually about 20 years ago well before uh dan uh, had come up with this idea because there's a guy there's a musician named richard finas who had uh, uh who had who went to Deleuze's lectures and recorded a whole lot of them. He was, he was less um, uh, faithful, if you will, to the, to attendance than Suzuki, but nonetheless, he attended a lot of them and he had his own recordings. And so he transcribed his recordings and put a lot of them up onto his own website, as well as he had a, part of his website for his music and a part of his website for Deleuze. And um, I got uh, roped into starting to do translations of those transcriptions, the stuff that he had on his website, so that he could get a lot of the English translations and also other languages uh, onto his website. And um, one of the things that I didn't realize um, at the time, and it's only been recently that I really become fully aware of this is just how much he edited out in putting his transcripts up um, from the actual uh, recordings that he made himself and that Suzuki made. Um, So what I've had to do, uh, I really become uh, distrustful of uh, anything that I haven't heard myself. And um, so I've just gone started to go through every single uh, recording that I work on, and I have gotten a really nice little process worked out where I'll, I'll, even if I have a transcript in, in hand, um, I'll listen to the recording with, the, I'll, li- I'll read the transcript first by itself and make my own edits on what I'm reading there if I see things that need to be cleaned. And then we'll go listen to it and then start filling in gaps because there inevitably are gaps. Uh, some shorter and some longer, depending on who's done the transcribing. And it's only then do I go on to do the uh, translations and try to make the translations actually be based on, um, you know, what what actually occurred. And a lot of times, you know, some of the things I'm talking about as gaps, these are not si- significant in the sense that, oh, my God, Stavall really captured that one word that makes everything different. You know, right. not yeah. at all. I mean, it's it, the, a lot of times, even the hesitations Deleuze has um, that might get edited out by somebody who says, oh, we don't want to hear Deleuze going um and ah. Right. Sometimes the hesitations are very, very significant because he's thinking and working out the concepts as he's delivering them to the students. And he's got a lesson plan. He's got a little, he's got a little 
piece of paper in front of him or several little pieces of paper, but he doesn't write out his lectures. He didn't write out his lectures. He, he just riffed off of his notes and he would bring texts into class, of course, that he would read from. So he would have a reference book and then he'd open up the book and he'd carefully read and comment uh, on something. And so that would take a while, but so he, he, would, he was really prepared, but a lot of the times it was, it was him creating a lot of this stuff with the students generated by their interest and a lot of times by the, their questions because certain questions would send him off in different directions and he would answer questions really thoroughly um, or he would just say to the student, you know what, that's a great question. Uh, and he, he, what he would want to say was, don't send me down that rabbit hole yeah. uh, because that would be for him. And he would just circle back around to it and try to come back to it, if not in the class uh, in another uh, session. And, but he really was a, a, a attentive to that. This brings me to a little bit of a more personal question, maybe, but it's something that I can only ask a few people in the world, including yourself. So you've listened to... Uh, probably hours and hours and hours of these lectures, um, met with Deleuze. After reading reading him as a grad student compared to now having listened to his voice for so long, um, what, what insight do you have that you wouldn't have had from reading the books about Deleuze the man or Deleuze the teacher or maybe even Deleuze plus Guattari, his relationships and interactions and things like that? Uh, well... I know that's an impossible thing to put into well, words. Just trying but... to, uh, what I'm trying to do is put myself back in my the, the frame the framework. Let's go back to the 1970s, that rosy time. The problem with reading all of that stuff at the time was that I I didn't have the um, uh, full enough of a grasp of the historical and sociocultural um, stakes that were involved in, say, anti-Oedipus. I, I didn't understand why um, staking out uh, a position uh, against uh, Freud and psychoanalysis was such a big deal. Why coming up with an alternate uh, reading uh, of Marx, not against Marx, but a read, the alternate reading of Marx within a sociocultural context, why that was such a big deal. Um, and even to stake out a position, not against Lacan, well, you know, still, this was not a uh, full on Jacques Lacan, why that was such a big deal in the in, in 1972, when anti-Oedipus came out. And I came to figure that out. And I realized that, you know, these guys had their own political commitments, but also intellectual commitments. And these intellectual commitments were things that then subsequently played out over the years and, and affected their lives. So what I didn't understand then was how post-structuralism as well, um, how the different kinds of uh, what we've sort of categorize, you know, within bookshelves and, and conferences and, and so forth within certain categories, how this was alive within the culture, how it became, how it developed through the uh, um, interplay between intellectuals uh, in France in the 1960s and 1970s. And, uh, you know, and Deleuze in a lot of ways um, was unusual, and then he stayed with his teaching career all the way to to you know completed a full career, and then retired at uh, in 1987, and um, you know had had done pretty much what he was able to do physically, having always been uh, uh, a little bit of in ill health for various reasons. Um, but uh, uh, I you know what I've what I've gotten subsequently out of uh, listening to these recordings is just, uh, you know, the human side uh, of this guy. Um, it was, it's, it's just fascinating to hear how he deals with the stuff that all teachers have to deal with, you know, classroom time management, um, uh, space issues, uh, bureaucratic issues, trying to get students to complete forms. Um, I mean, these, <laughs> yeah. these don't, these don't, you know, 
these don't occupy huge amounts of time uh, in these recordings, I, I have to confess, but that's precisely that. You'd hear like there's right at the end of one of the things I was just working on. He, he, he points out at the beginning of the class that, you know, there are these little yellow forms that you have to have. Um, and I have to have, Liz has to have, uh, so that I can go on and teach this next part of, of the semester. So be sure to fill those out. So he gets through the whole lecture. Two hours later, he's he's wrapping things up and he goes, oh, yeah, and and, and the little yellow forms, the little <laughs> yellow forms. Here you got this, uh, you know, this renowned scholar, this this philosopher. All of a sudden, could you? And, and then you hear him right next to the microphone. He's whispering. He's saying, "Oh God, I wish I didn't have to chase after them." You know, <laughs> and, it's, and it's so funny to to hear. You know that you think, "Oh, oh my God, he he's." He's dealing with the same kind of stuff that we're, as teachers that we're all dealing with, um, and dealing. And that was one of the reasons why he, well, in fact, he, he decided to retire when he when he did. He, he mentions this in the obvious there. He just basically got worn down by uh, the bureaucracy, and uh, and, and he, he just felt that the demands on his time and the demands on teachers in general had come to a point where he had to part ways. It was just. Uh, it was it was just there's not getting the payoff. And he also felt physically that he wasn't able to give what he felt was needed uh, in his physical performances, because that's the other thing you hear to what extent these are performances. I mean, he's just uh, when he's on, he's really on and um, he's just investing um all kinds of energy into these two hour sessions and just, I mean, just keeping track of where he's going in this flow of ideas is, is, is amazing enough, but then to sort of invest this kind of, he creates different personalities um, as he's presenting stuff. He'll mimic stuff. He'll take on the personality of Leibniz and he'll sort of, you know, channel inner Leibniz or he'll throw in a little inner niche. And and then and you're when you're transcribing this, trying to figure out who's speaking here, that's one of the trickiest things is to just try to, you know, sort those things out so that the reader will be able to understand that, okay, this is not Deleuze speaking in his own voice. This is him presenting Leibniz in a particular way, just to take one example. Um, and he said, I, "This is just a personal question." He said, "There's a lot of uh, notes in his writing where he's um, borderline. He's ironic or sardonic or a little subversive. Does any of that trickiness come out in these lectures, or that feeling of him uh, being a gadfly?" Uh, well, uh, yeah, I don't. I think that the very nature of judging somebody to be a gadfly is that you're kind of a fly on the wall, just judging the guy. I, I don't, I don't, he, he, he's very, very genuine. You know, he's not yeah. trying. He, that's, that's, that's one of the things that um, he's very forthright about. He's really not trying to mess with anybody's minds. He's really not trying to play any games. Um, he'll speak his mind uh, pretty forthrightly. Uh, but on the other hand, he is really one of the kindest uh, individuals. I mean, the way he, deals with the students, um, even the students, particularly the students who are, you can tell, are the most endangered. There is this one student um, who, uh, in the cinema seminars, I, I, I was listening to this recently, she, she has a crush on Deleuze, and she <laughs> basically stands up in class, and, and she wants to profess, she has the, the pretext is to give a presentation on a particular topic that they're discussing, but she basically just confesses in front of the whole class that she just wants to get to know him and hang out with him. And apparently she called him the weekend before at home and had been talking to him. So he kind of knew this was coming, that there was this issue, but the way he dealt with her was just so kind, um, honest, um, you know, like in front of all the students, you know, this really isn't going anywhere. But uh, on the other hand, he asked her to come back, make sure that she came back the following week to discuss in the class the topic that she wanted to talk about. Not not her her crush on Deleuze, but the literary topic. And so right. he does. She does come back. Unfortunately, uh, more fortunately, perhaps, I don't know, uh, that that presentation was never recorded. It's, I think both Suzuki and um, Pinas 
uh, cut off the recording at that point, and the recording starts up after her presentation. But Liz did ask her at the beginning of class the next time to to, to speak, and uh, you know, it's just it, but. But, but that's an extreme all the time. He's very, very uh, conscious of being, um, you know, working with the students and being careful with the students and and, and trying to help them and, and making every effort in his lectures. You just hear it in the language he uses, um, It particularly his self-reproaches when he thinks he's gone too fast, uh, when he thinks he hasn't developed something sufficiently, he'll go back over something. Um, in fact, you know, his, some of the judgments that are made or his harshest ones are him on himself uh, coming back and going back over something he felt he screwed up. So it's, uh, it's, it's I, I don't know, I don't see any of the, what you, you described there in, in in his actual personality, just somebody who had that generosity. I mean, the idea that he actually took time out back in 1985 to, to invite me over to his apartment to have a drink with this young American who, you know, had all these questions for him. And he just said, you know, basically it was, you know, chill out, have a drink, let's just talk. And um, no, I'm not giving you an interview. And... Uh, <laughs> And but, you know, it's, it's nice to meet new people. And it, it was I understand now much better than I did then, you know, uh, 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 where where that was coming from. What kind of drink did he offer you? I think I had I think I chose a whiskey. I mean, I I had a whole had a whole choice, um, but I think I chose the whiskey. Very nice. I wonder if the uh, university administration or the department heads had the same impression of of him as his students. Ah, yes. Well, he got along with, you know, his, 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 his uh, immediate supervisors. Uh, right, right. Well, I mean, what is philosophy? He goes off on the bureaucratization and then marketing dimensions of, of, of uh, the university. Anyway, I have one more question for you. Okay. Um, Cause surely going through this stuff, raking, raking the muck in the detail that you've done, offers a, a lot of surprises. So I just wanted to know if there's a surprise or moment or instance that sticks out to you in uh, going through all this when your mind was just blown for a second and it had it forced you to reconsider your previous positions. Uh, well, mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, this would be the time where we would, we would take a break and I could go, I, I could think about, I mean, I've, I've had my mind blown but not for the reasons that, you know, you just suggesting that I just had to sort of rethink everything. Um, I guess um, the real um, wake up for me um, concerned the cinema books, because for me, the cinema books, for all practical purposes, were impenetrable, uninteresting and impenetrable until I started working on um, this project. And then I came to understand more clearly where he was coming from, what had proceeded. Um, and then, and, and this was a long haul for him, yeah. but he really had a commitment to this. He really had a commitment to trying to work through the concepts uh, of cinema, work through the concepts of Bergson, because Bergson is the jumping off point for the cinema books. And I just hadn't, Full, I mean, I knew that, but I hadn't fully appreciated that. And then Charles Sanders' purse and the Persian um, structures, terminology that he brings to uh, this project, um, that was always the most off-putting to me. Um, why bother in coming up with this sort of uh, weird terminology for these different uh, effects of cinema? I'm not really sure yet. I've, I've fully answered that question question for myself with any satisfaction, but I can see how in in the lectures these uh, are, are important turning points for just trying to conceptualize um, the different aspects of the, the movement image and the shift to the time image. I'm not sure still, and that was another misgiving I always had about the cinema books, I'm not sure that that double structure really works. Mm. Um, doesn't satisfy me, frankly, very much uh, in thinking about cinema. But then again, um, you know, I think about cinema in, in, in a very, very lazy sort of way. And uh, I certainly admit that Deleuze isn't lazy when it comes to, to thinking through cinema. And that's these books are proof to that. All right. Wow. OK, great. We are about at time here. So uh, I have a closing question, but I'd like to first uh, thank you. 
Charles, Charles Duvall, for hopping on with us today and for keeping us youngins in check. <laughs> we cannot. We got. We got to revise our our. You know what we think are radical opinions every so once in a while. So um, please look at the links in the description if your appetite has been whetted. I'm gonna go back through this when I edit and try to find all the things that have been referenced by by Charles here. But most especially is the seminar project out of Purdue, um, co-project with Daniel W. Smith, and it sounds like a lot of other people. So I'll link. I'll find as many links to that as I can. Um, and it feels like we've barely scratched the surface here, even after uh, over an hour. So um, I think people are getting a little more excited about Deleuze for whatever reason. And you, as someone who's almost dedicated your your life to to projects like this, um, would you say it's a it's a worthy endeavor, even if you don't do it specifically in in school? Is there enough Deleuze to keep you going for you know another lifetime? Oh yeah. Oh goodness. Grief. Yes. Um, well, you know, I mean, this is this is my retirement now, so uh, uh, I'm enjoying it every day. I get up and I do do a little Deleuze. So uh, I think there's there's a lot to be said about that. A little Deleuze and a little yoga, you know, take you a long way. Yeah, and most of the most of the boomers are heading down to Florida at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> good on you. Um, there you have it. This is Plastic Pills for the Plastic Pills podcast. We have an overdose episode with Charles Duvall. And, you know, based on your feedback, we might have to have Charles back if he has if he has the time. So thanks so much, Charles. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'll stop recording. Mm -hmm.